um, through New York law and human rights circles. Um, she is uh, a distinguished professor, uh, the Ernst C. Stiefel Professor of Comparative Law at New York Law School in the city. She's also a visiting professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science in London. Um, her first book, uh, which is called Transitional Justice, came out from Oxford University Press in 2000 and was one of, I think, the first and most important books in what became the transitional justice literature of the time. Uh, the, the, the idea of how you do justice um, after a period of oppression or, or atrocities. And uh, it, it, was, it really helped define the field when it came out. Um, she has a new book out, which I think is already uh, doing the same thing. Um, her new book is called Humanity's Law, uh, a beautiful book, again done by Oxford University Press. Um, it's re recently called by Jeffrey Robertson, who's one of the leading human rights lawyers and scholars over in England, uh, one of the two or three best books uh, in human rights of the year in 2011. Um, it's, it's part of a series of new books that are coming out that are basically after years of people being depressed about human rights and how human rights you know, is a great ideal but doesn't work, are starting to celebrate the successes of, um, of, of a number of human rights legal victories uh, uh, around the world and uh, making a claim that there is a, a new and actionable and meaningful idea of international law, which is now being, in a sense, collapsing, and she'll talk about a number of different strains of international law into a new idea called humanities law, or international human rights law. Um, I have a series of discounted flyers that uh, her press has generally, generously provided. You save $7 if you order from one of these flyers, the book. So I will... Um, you can save even more on Amazon. So. And you can even save more on Amazon, so you can uh, take your pick. Um, however you want to order it, uh, it, it it's, it's a book that uh, I, I think is very much well worth reading for, for human rights leaders here at Bard. Um, and I'm sure you'll start seeing it in some of your classes in the next couple of years. In any case, it's my pleasure to welcome you to TED Talk. Thanks a lot, Roger, and uh, uh, see other friends, Tom, and uh, very good to, to be here. Um, so I think one of them, maybe two times, and once before I part but, uh, for a conference. But it's wonderful to be back. So uh, Roger mentioned uh, transitional justice. Um, what I started seeing after I wrote uh, Transitional Justice in 2000 was uh, he was a book where I really you know focused on political and legal responses uh, after repression and uh, and political conflict and what became apparent was that even though there were a number of places in the world which seemed to be sort of lurching towards democratic peace that uh, the issues uh, concerning the relationship of law and violence um, weren't solved uh, in many cases in the transition. And this has led to a lot of writing, for example, about the role of transitional justice not after the conflict, but, but before and during conflict. And so, since I uh, cared to confine the term of transitional justice to uh, the period of transition, I started focusing really on what was the nature of law that was really, uh, that pertain now to these uh, periods of uh, what I'm going to describe as ch rather changed conflict. It's not the traditional understanding of war uh, that um, focused on relations between states and had this view of an honor code uh, guiding war. Instead, uh, the key idea in humanities law is that there's a transformation uh, in, in uh, the uh, key uh, goal and that rather than the, the focus on state security, that a lot of the, uh, of the conflicts we're seeing uh, emphasize the protection of, uh, and security of persons and peoples. 
And uh, what I talk about in the book and tease out over 300 pages is really what the framework is of humanities law. Uh, I argue that there is this um, new law, which is really uh, three bodies of existing law. Uh, the law of war, uh, the law of human rights, and international criminal uh, justice. I say, and I'm going to say a little something about each of these frameworks, um, I, uh, I, while that framework appears to emer be emerging now, it, it definitely has resonances and, and, um, and connects to uh, early pre-modern uh, thinkers such as um, Grotius, Hugo Grotius, who was really the architect of uh, international <coughs> law. Uh, and in my book, I go into uh, that history and his understanding of the way law, and, and in particular international law, was uh, uh, really a key defining um, uh, uh, modality uh, in, in constructing global society. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I want to talk about, but I think the, really the best way to uh, to develop this idea of humanities law is to uh, talk about some key moments uh, historically in the last uh, 15 years uh, where we can see this uh, concept uh, developing and then, um, you know, along the way talk about some illustrations of where it's been invoked by political leaders and, and others. And I want to make clear that this, the, the purchase of, of, of this idea if, if it has any, is really, does it help us understand uh, the, the current moment uh, better? Uh, you know, and, and it's a discourse that I argue in the book is used uh, not just by uh, state actors, but by non-state actors, NGOs, uh, by private uh, uh, actors, individuals, uh, by uh, multilateral institutions uh, such as the UN, uh, and in particular we're seeing a lot of play in the Security Council. So the book maps this rise of humanities law, and uh, in, in particular, uh, um, I just want to talk about these three strands and, and how we can see these strands developing. Uh, uh, you know, you can go back 50, 60 years to, to the end of World War II for some of these developments, but I want to also show how it's different today and, um, and uh, elements where, where there's, you know, where we can see a kind of consolidation. So uh, the strand uh, that, you know, that I talked about, this transformation in, in, uh, of the way we thought of international law in the 20th century, and, you know, I teach international law, um, and I also teach international human rights law, and transitional justice. So in, when you think about international law, most of the books uh, in this area really uh, describe uh, the, the themes, the goals of international law, the subjects of international law in terms of the state. It's state-centric, sovereignty-based. Uh, what international law does is reflect state interests, and, uh, and, uh, and conflict is also defined in, in those terms. Now, what we start seeing uh, in, in recent years is a change in that view. And part of what I uh, describe as informing the humanity law framework is restoring uh, other subjects, persons and peoples, who had been very uh, present in uh, the pre-modern state uh, uh, um, understanding. Uh, they uh, helped shape the practices we know of as the use gentium, the law of peoples, um, that later became known as law of nations, but it wasn't really confined to state centricity. There were uh, a number of areas of law, the law of aliens, um, uh, trade law, which specifically recognized the input of, uh, of other actors. Now, uh, so that's really, you know, it's this move from that, uh, from that understanding. Some people describe this, have said that I'm describing a paradigm shift, and the blurbs on the back suggest that. I'm always uncomfortable with, you know, saying that I'm inventing a paradigm shift or describing a paradigm shift. Maybe it is. We'll see. Um, let's think about some areas where the categories as they were understood are breaking down. So one uh, place, and I'll describe about three. Uh, people seem to like trinities. I'm sure that's the general uh, culture that we're in, right? Um, the, the breakdown of the categories of, of war and peace. So there are bodies of law, and international law tends to govern uh, um, two major areas. 
where states came together. And it's pretty obvious. The market, trade, and war, right? That's how states come together. The peaceful, you know, peaceful links are, are trade, the others are uh, less peaceful. And so, you know, the area of war uh, is now uh, in, in the midst of change. And, um, and what we see is that, uh, you know, by some we're in a more peaceful time, uh, certainly since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but what we saw post-Cold War is that we didn't have an immediate uh, peace dividend, but rather the breakup of the, the former Yugoslavia and, um, and this uh, uh, conflict that was you know, in, in some parts of the region internal and in others international. So you know, um, you know, this kind of, of um, uh, undermining of the usual uh, uh, stability of, of international law, because the law of war uh, tends to separate these two out, and there's a whole body of law that regulates in international conflict in the Geneva Conventions and Hague Conventions, and, and another body of law that governs internal conflict. Now, you know, what we see in recent cases uh, is a greater willingness to entertain that some conflicts are both internal and international, and uh, to move away from that very strict view of, uh, of conflict. Um, and it, and it, you know, I think it's a realistic view because in many of these instances, whether the Turi conflict in Congo or the uh, conflict in the Balkans, um, uh, some of the conflict is internal and some of it is international. But that very understanding really only corresponded to the view from the perspective of a state, right? And where the major focus is protection of state borders. If, if you, the lens is from the human perspective and protection of, of the human, then what difference should it make whether a conflict is internal or international in, with regard to the, the, uh, the guarantee or degree of protection? And so this is part of what is being um, uh, figured out in a number of different conflicts. Um, there are a number of court, uh, very interesting uh, tribunals and courts that have, uh, uh, that have gone into this, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but, you know, so that's one of the changes, is, is really uh, this um, uh, a question of uh, change in uh, the, uh, the legal regime that applies to war and peace. Um, you know, and I want to, I'll bring in uh, the strand of human rights law in just a second because not only do we have changes in the strands that relate to war, uh, but uh, the law of peace, of course, uh, is human rights law. That's what, uh, what applies uh, internationally during peacetime. Um, and here, too, we see changes. Uh, um, the uh, area of human rights uh, was always uh, uh, viewed as, as a claims, a set of claims that one could make vis-a-vis -vis the state, uh, and, um, and uh, in general state action had to be shown, it was like constitutional law, it was seen as a claim that, you, that uh, citizens had vis-a-vis -vis states. Now this too is changing, and with a number of different scenarios, the quote-unquote global war on terror, um, other areas of, that involving human security, uh, the claims uh, are no longer being made in those terms. And, and we see more and more recognition by courts of, of expanded duties that states have even when the action might be private action. Uh, so for example, uh, militias or, or gangsters in a drug war. Um, and, uh, and this too involves a, a, a part of this area, this framework that I call uh, humanities law, because the, the uh, overriding aim in these, uh, in, in, in in caring less about those acoustic, what had been acoustically separated uh, ideas or categories, the, the overriding goal in these decisions uh, by uh, judges is, is the protection of, of the human. Now, uh, um, in, in terms of the law of war, there's one other strand that I want to add here that had been separated since the uh, pre-Westphalia, and that is the uh, just war, the, the aspect of the law of war that also brings in not just how a war is waged, but when is war, initiation of war uh, prop normatively uh, right. Uh, and, and, and this is really, this goes to the heart of what I'm describing here, which is that, you know, if I were to distill this book to a one-liner, which I hate doing, but I will do just as a, for, you know, to try it out, um, it is that there, there is more and more uh, legalization and, and meshing of, of the law in uh, areas of, uh, of conflict with the goal of human security. 
And, uh, and what we see is that this, this value is not just a constraint on action, but it's also something that can operate as a basis for, uh, for intervention. Intervention of many kinds, military intervention, a legal intervention, uh, etc. And this will, you know, I hope we'll have time in Q&A to get to, you know, get into some of the tensions. I know that um, that Roger uh, has, uh, you know, uh, branded me an optimist, but you know, I'm, an, I'm a realistic optimist, uh, uh, and and certainly this this uh, set of developments is not necessarily always going to result in a progressive uh, uh, a result. There are areas of tension. And uh, certainly the normativity way exceeds the execution and the, uh, the current uh, uh, institutionalization of, of these ideas. So there is still a gap, let's say, between substance and, and process. Uh, that you know, could be one way to, to understand. Um, now, just to go back to the change in terms of the, of the use ad bellum, the, the old idea that was sometimes described as the just war tradition, we see a greater willingness since the end of the Cold War to intervene militarily uh, uh, with uh, the, the asserted aim of human security. Uh, the most recent example, which was explicitly uh, justified in these ground, on these grounds, was Libya. Uh, it was the first time that the responsibility to protect was, was enunciated in a Security Council resolution uh, that was uh, about uh, clearing the airspace, if you will. We later saw that it was regime change uh, that, that would result. Mm. But certainly it was clear that it would be military intervention. And, and uh, it, you know, this, was, this is bringing together the idea of justice and the use of force in a very clear way. It's not provided for in the Security Council, um, uh, uh, the other materials that the Security Council uh, relies on, such as the UN Charter. Uh, the UN Charter uh, sets out uh, state security and protection of state borders, and that really was the legal framework that the Security Council has been operating in since the end of World War II. So this is, a, a, you know, and, and, and there's certainly uh, precedents that I want to get into that predate Libya, such as the intervention in the Balkans in Kosovo. But so what we start seeing is a greater uh, tolerance uh, for this kind of, of justification. And part of the argument here is that if we can better understand uh, the asserted justifications and the aims of, of uh, this humanity law discourse, the way it's being used both politically and legally by both political actors and legal actors, then we can, uh, I think, uh, develop a better evaluative uh, uh, and critical eye. Uh, to what extent are the justifications uh, genuine? Uh, uh, are they really deliverable? Uh, is there a practical plan? Those are the kinds of, of evaluation, evaluative schemes we, we could uh, raise. Now, the last, uh, you know, I mentioned the internal and international, which relates to this change in, in conflict. Uh, the last uh, aspect of the way law is changing in this framework is um, the move uh, to add this, the coercive enforcement um, certainly since, um, uh, again, the Treaty of Westphalia, the, uh, the uh, relationship of states and the protection of state sovereignty uh, certainly um, had in, in consequences for the uh, extent to which there was consensus in, in any kind of international society on, on uh, the an, a willingness to, to entertain um, mechanisms of judgment, shall we say. Um, and uh, and in the, if you think of the writings, if you go back to the writings of Hugo Grotius, part of the concern once you get into the modern state and consolidation of, of state borders is the uh, there really is no uh, shared concept of who would be the appropriate judge of where judgment would lie, and and, and so it's always seen as politicized uh, this idea of of, of judgment. Now, today, uh, uh, it, you know, one could say au contraire, and that there's this alacrity with which uh, there is a turn to tribunalization and to, you know, a quest for an independent uh, judicial uh, um, eye. And that's gone uh, hand in hand with a move away from collective enforcement, so this is the third uh, bit, uh, dimension of change, 
war and peace, international and internal, and the and last bit is, is the move away from collective understandings of punishment and enforcement, which are really at the heart of the existing post-World War II security framework. When the Security Council issued sanctions, in the past the sanctions were seen as something that was collective, it was on a country, right? And, and these, you know, if you think back to the really controversial sanctions in Iraq, and the impact that had on the humanitarian aims, the way the impact that it had on the people of Iraq. I'm not talking about the most recent intervention in Iraq, but going back uh, at the time of the, of the uh, you know the attempt to occupy Kuwait uh, by uh, Saddam Hussein and George uh, Bush uh, Senior. That was a highly controversial moment. The use, the you know, use of collective sanctions, even with a just cause, right? The the likely genocide of Kurds uh, on the border. It was a very tough uh, time, and I think it pits, you know, these these aims. You know, it really is an interesting lens to think about these ends. Well, part of what we're seeing is that it, if humanity's law logic is going to uh, be the comprehensive value, the value is human security, then the sanctions can't imperil the, you know, the, the humanitarian uh, uh, well-being. And so what we start seeing is that uh, the, uh, the aims are framed in terms of um, uh, protection of persons and peoples, but that, uh, you know, in the past the normativity had developed, but the enforcement lagged way behind. Now the, the way out of this is to uh, focus on the individual. And what we see is even at the Security Council, the sanctions are becoming targeted sanctions, right? And the most recent set of sanctions that the Arab League uh, came up with uh, with respect to Syria also sought to uh, carefully delineate a line. And look, it's not going to be a perfect line because already there, there are questions being raised about how the sanctions that have been uh, that they've approved, and it's the first time really that the Arab League has approved sanctions on their own vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, a state in the region. Region. And uh, and there will be economic consequences that no doubt transcend just you know uh, uh, the the uh, the existing regime and their supporters. Nevertheless, it's that effort to single them out, and that is really you know part of the targeting uh, process. And it, we've seen this shift in both areas of civil law. Uh, we can see it in uh, lawsuits in the United States on human rights grounds. We can see it in regional tribunals in Europe and in Latin America. And we also see it in this uh, rush to create new criminal uh, courts and to uh, pull together the, the sort of this moralizing aim and value of, of, of human protection together with the harshest uh, uh, form of law, of uh, criminal law. And you know, really to condemn those who are outliers and violating these um, these norms. And so it's really a remarkable list of criminal courts in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, and so I just want to take you through that um, that that uh, um, you know I'll try to be brief. Uh, take you through that history because it really uh, gives us a sense of some of the uh, of these really these three tra changes the way the uh, the framework has evolved uh, and um, and then uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to uh, see how uh, this has panned out in the uh, in the move towards a responsibility to protect uh, and um, in in both Libya and potentially uh, other other places as well uh, in the near future. Now, I, I just want to say my work tends is interpretive. Not it's not a, a three hundred page op ed. It's not necessarily exhorting for these developments. It's it's kind of you know my prior book also was interpretive. I'm happy to talk about what that means. Uh, but uh, basically, it's really uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, these changes and trying to make sense of them. So if we uh, uh, go to Nuremberg, which. Um, uh, is an interesting moment. Uh, I, I want to talk about Nuremberg, and then I'll talk about the uh, the um, ICTY and ICTR, these uh, uh, exceptional tribunals, ad hoc tribunals that were created at the end of the Cold War, and then talk about the ICC, and then we can pull to the to the present uh, um, and see how the Security Council is operating together with a criminal court and and using the criminal court uh, uh, for its mm -hmm. purposes. Now, the, um, the Nuremberg uh, I, uh, moment it was, is very interesting. Nuremberg is, off, is today 
uh, generally remembered for uh, its human rights legacy. It's often, you know, when you read a book like Lou Hankins or traditional human rights books, they often to say that the birth of the human rights uh, movement uh, uh, was, was at Nuremberg. Um, and, but what I uh, want to uh, emphasize is that, is that there were uh, really three, these three strands that I'm talking about uh, came together then. It was a brief moment, uh, but it was a moment that uh, related to a particular conflict. And, and you have um, really what was, uh, what was seen as the major offense at Nuremberg at the time. Now we think of the crimes against humanity as, as the major uh, uh, concern. But really at the time it was the war, it was aggression. And this, this is really the strand that relates to the just war, right? It was punishing, um, uh, indivi you know, and I want to talk about the individuation, it was very significant that you have individuation of punishment, right? That's, you know, a central theme at Nuremberg. The reason that's important is that seen historically, uh, Germany had been punished as a country uh, after World War I. And that, you know, it was Versailles and the very, uh, 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 very heavy uh, collective sanctions, monetary sanctions. And, you know, so we can compare, you know, the effect of collective sanctions versus individual criminal punishment. And so that, that move uh, uh, already occurred at Nuremberg. Um, now, is the tribunal as international as what we have today? No. Uh, you know, it can be seen as victor's justice in the sense that they were victors, right? And they don't, they don't prosecute their own, uh, their own uh, shortcomings and their own war crimes and, you know, certainly, um, uh, the attempt today to have a standing uh, court, which I'll talk about in just a bit, the International Criminal Court is in a sense in bits foreshadowed by Nuremberg, but is also different. It couldn't be more, you know, more international. It was the product of a General Assembly uh, debate and resolutions. Uh, it now has uh, hundreds of countries that are signatories and many regions of the world represented. And the major difference is that it's a standing court and it's not can't be accused of victor's justice because it weighs in before you even know what the result of the war will be. So that's you know a, a difference. But Nuremberg was individuated. Uh, it was it brought together these strands of both the, the just war tradition, the punishing, the uh, what was seen as unjust aggression. Uh, and it brought together war crimes, the, the, the execution of the war, right, violations that involved, uh, that, that related to the waging of war, and it brought together uh, this new piece, crimes against humanity. But, you know, I'm saying we remember it now for that, that innovation of, of having crimes against humanity uh, codified in a sense because it was in the charter, in the statute at, Nur at the time of Nuremberg. It was really the first time that it was defined and written down in that way. There were, of course, invocations to crimes against humanity previously in remonstrances, uh, mostly regarding religious uh, persecution, but also crimes uh, at, uh, during World War I. Um, now, the, the, this crossroads is a very interesting crossroads, um, uh, and you have this uh, emphasis on um, enforcement, uh, and you also have this recognition that it shouldn't matter uh, whether, uh, you know, with respect to crimes against humanity, it shouldn't matter whether these are civilians that were civilians in Germany or civilians in foreign countries. And that was uh, also a very uh, significant moment uh, that we later see um, is being uh, underscored today. Um, and, you know, the critical language in the Nuremberg Charter, and I still think this is the most important word in the entire uh, charter, and it's one, a very short word, it's a preposition, any any civilian population. So just having, you know, it was this idea that this is universalizable, even if it's with respect to a conflict and a certain, certain states involved, that it really isn't just about protecting uh, in the old, old way that the law of war uh, uh, protected. Now, I want to I move on to, uh, to uh, talk about the more current moment, but what, what I think what's important uh, is that at the end of Nuremberg, at the end of World War II, as we all know, the Cold War set in, and there were political realities that made uh, you know, shoring up that, that judgment in, and codifying it and creating a standing court impossible, right? And there are those who think that the current moment, in a way, is sort of a revival of that idea of the possibility of having a community, international community of, of judgment. Um, 
Uh, but what we do see is that the normativity moves on, that you do have a genocide convention that is passed during the Cold War, and you have a number of other conventions uh, that, that relate to um, expansion of humanitarian norms in, in wars of self-determination. You have you know, a number of developments in the 70s and 80s. You have uh, expansion of the Gen Geneva Conventions. Um, but what's very interesting about all of those is that they, they do not uh, have the, uh, society, the, the international consensus uh, to create added enforcement bodies. Uh, it is understood uh, at the time that, uh, that enforcement will, will depend on states and ideas of reciprocity. And um, yeah, you do have references in, uh, with respect to genocide that, uh, that uh, third party states should enforce. And there are, uh, you know, there is a duty, you could say, in, in the Geneva Convention that with respect to the worst crimes in international conflict, rape breaches, that other states uh, have a duty to enforce. But you, don't, you certainly don't have the institutionalization that we're seeing uh, today. So it's an interesting moment, the post-Cold War moment, I mean the, the Cold War moment, because it kind of gives us this flavor of, the, of, the, uh, of a, a certain commitment to, you could say, norms in the air to some extent, but really the way that, uh, that the sovereignty uh, question is resolved or reconciled with these uh, arguably universalizable norms is that states are the first actors that have to enforce, and in many cases the only, it will be the first and, 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 and probably the last. Now, what happens in the, um, the post-Cold War moment is that you see uh, what I'm arguing, which is this realignment of the relationship of law uh, to the use of force, um, uh, a very bewildering set of, of developments, um, and that is that at the end of, of the Cold War, and, and you, know, you know, surprise, surprise, a recognition of a variety of states that had, uh, um, uh, had unresolved transitional justice going back to World War II, relations between Serb, you know, Croat, and, and Muslim uh, 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 peoples in the region. Um, you know, in retrospect, it all should have been very clear, uh, but, it, but it wasn't. And, uh, and then, the, the, really, the issue became, uh, uh, you know, the turn, you know, what is, uh, as I said, bewildering and, and very interesting is this turn to law and invocations of justice during conflict. Now, you know, to what extent is this just rhetoric? Well, part of what one sees is, the, you know, the significance of, of um, you know, the, the move to individual punishment. Um, the, uh, at, certainly at the beginning, there was an absence of consensus on, on more coercive um, uh, relationship of law to the use of force, which would be to authorize intervention. Um, and even when intervention occurs, it's not explicitly authorized by the Security Council. So we see that politics runs out, right? Politics runs out and coerce, coercion comes in, which is the, the use of both the law and, uh, and uh, military means. And uh, that would not have been surprising to, that relationship would not have been surprising uh, to Grotius, but he, uh, uh, like the, I think many theorists, political analysts and, and legal theorists at the time of, of the Balkans uh, would argue uh, that this should at least be limited to very uh, clear cases of, of uh, genocide and crimes against humanity. What was very interesting, um, and I think is really the most contested um, uh, um, issue about the Balkans uh, was the fact that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, much of the conflict was internal and yet was being considered as a threat to international peace and security. And what the Security Council uh, declares after there's evidence that was gathered uh, by a, a journalist, uh, uh, Roy Gutman, uh, he was writing for a Long Island paper, uh, uh, came, uh, had interviews and a video of of incarceration and detention camps, and he called them concentration camps. It wasn't annihilation that was going on, but there was definitely a torture, and then later there were parts, we certainly saw that there were parts of the region where there was uh, uh, genocidal uh, uh, killings. So uh, that revelation uh, uh, called, you know, started the drumbeat for uh, demand uh, to do something, and in particular, that video was very significant because it showed uh, you know, the, these uh, uh, emaciated detainees behind barbed wire and it looked, you know, it was like in the heart of Europe, is this going to happen 
uh, again, and now it will be on the UN watch, you know, uh, uh, Security Council watch. And um, as I said, the politics uh, uh, did not, given how split uh, many of the states in the Security Council were, the French, uh, going back to World War II, were still very pro-Serb and, and protected uh, many uh, of the, the, rep the fugitives on the run uh, to, to, to the very recent days. Uh, the Germans were the first to recognize Croatia. I mean, you know, in many ways you could see that the politics could, couldn't be solved. Uh, and so what, uh, what you find is the Security Council authorizing uh, um, uh, a court, a court uh, under its uh, UN Charter, Chapter 7 powers, which are all about restoring the peace. And it's this very interesting relationship that, uh, that uh, I'm uh, asking you to entertain, which is the uh, relationship of peace and justice, of bringing law and, in and justice uh, to, uh, to um, address uh, conflict. And, uh, and here it's stated in a very, you know, the expectations are very high. Uh, the UN Charter Chapter 7 uh, basis for the, this court, the ICTY, was essentially that, that the court could deter future, these, the, you know, the ongoing uh, uh, violations and that it could restore uh, peace in the region. Um, and then uh, I would say the most, the most ambitious goals are reconciliation, the idea that it's not just deterrence, right, and those of you who may are interested in law, generally we think of criminal law and courts as, as achieving the goal of deterrence, and that is something that relates to peace and stability, and so that's not a surprising goal for the criminal, uh, for, for, uh, criminal justice. But it was also this uh, added view that somehow there would, could be reconciliation between peoples. And how would that occur? So that's really a very interesting um, a moment. And, um, and uh, you know, since I'm interested not just in, the, in human rights that relate to persons and individuals, but really also the relationship of individuals to peoples, and that was really at the heart of this conflict, um, the, the, you know, what you find is that the court was explicitly uh, ethno-conscious. Um, uh, everyone was identified by their ethnicity, from the prosecutors to the defense counsel to defendants. And in particular, the central crime was the crime of ethnic cleansing, the offense of ethnic cleansing. And no one had seen that term uh, um, uh, written down, uh, expressed that way. I still, I still use it in quotes. I, I, it can't be mistaken for a normative term, for a term, you know, that view that, that, that there is ethnic cleansing, right, that, that, that we're involved uh, somehow in any kind of vindication of, of ethnic cleansing. It came from the fact that elites had supported uh, uh, the Milosevic strategy, including a white paper that was part of the Academy of Science uh, in Serbia, and they referred to it, and Milosevic referred to pollution, by various uh, peoples in the region and talked about the need to ethnically cleanse uh, uh, Serbia. And that was really, is, it remains, uh, I would argue, the most contested norm that uh, all of these tribunals and legalization are addressing. Genocide has been accepted since the end of World War II. Uh, war crimes have a pedigree that is uh, uh, much older, right? It goes back, really, you could go back to the Bible and earlier other religious codes that talk about uh, don't burn the land, don't attack uh, women and children, uh, uh, you know, uh, targets that are seen as not related to military targets, not not necessary, not proportional, but the question of limiting the sovereign uh, from uh, uh, what it, ethnic cleansing is not a, about um, annihilation, it's about changing, right, cleansing, what is being ethnically cleansed? The land, okay, and what is being limited here and was really at the heart of the tribunal and really the, the normative change, the, you know, if you will, the court was doing norm entrepreneurial uh, business because what they were trying to do is, is, uh, is um, uh, punish this purposeful uh, policy to purge from various parts of, uh, of uh, Serbia the uh, civilian population that uh, belonged uh, to uh, different ethnic groups. And so it's really a set of different, you know, it's punishing a, a variety of means. Sometimes it can be uh, another crime against humanity. Sometimes it could be rape or murder, but not always. It could be busing people from one part of, of the land to another uh, if it's done systematically uh, and involves uh, um, uh, the, uh, the elements I've talked about, widespread and systematic. So this is really, this was really the Security Council saying that when, when 
the leaders in, in you know this, in the Serbian regime do this. This goes to the heart and, and somehow undermines international security. And it's that connection really that uh, that uh, reminds us of the relationship of individuals um, uh, to peoples and peoples to humanity. And uh, and it really continues, I would argue, to be a contested norm. It's one of the most difficult uh, um, uh, uh, offenses to prove and to apply. Uh, certainly the ICC has been involved in related uh, prosecutions, in, uh, in largely uh, uh, coming out of the conflict uh, in parts of Africa, but it was really at the heart of what the ICTY tribunal was out to do. Now what's very interesting is that the ICTR also had uh, norm change in how they uh, define genocide. Uh, they, uh, you know, part of the way they dealt with some of these uh, issues uh, involving what was clearly internal conflict. So that was uh, uh, a, uh, you know, yet another step in what I'm talking about because the genocide in Rwanda was clearly uh, internal. Of course, that depends whether you regard as sacrosanct the, the, the existing borders of, of Rwanda, uh, when in fact uh, many of the, of the issues and conflict between Hutu and Tutsi related to the entire region, in particular Burundi, and that's part of what we're seeing is that these conflicts can't be solved uh, unless they're seen from a humanity uh, law uh, lens. And with respect to the EICTR, they took a, a, a broader view of how peoples would be defined for purposes of genocide. And all of this is to say that, um, that part of what we saw during the post-Cold War period was really a move away from seeing uh, the business of international law and interna international tribunals as the protection of state security as understood as protecting existing state borders, which had a very a long uh, um, um, you know, legacy in international law, and it goes by this fancy Latin term which one is obliged to teach in international law, ute posedatis, which says that you know, the default norm is you protect existing borders, and it really shifts the concern for the protection of human security, and, and in many cases, uh, judges uh, uh, played, uh, you know, with the, uh, the the very issue of what category of law would apply. Certainly, that was the case in the ICTY. Uh, Ted Marone uh, uh, was, uh, you know, is both a jurist and was president of the tribunal and was very active in in developing the law in this direction. Now, um, let me just. What do I have? Another ten minutes or so? Ten, 15, yeah. five, five, ten minutes. Okay, so. Um, you know how it is with professors. In the beginning, they think they're going to talk short, and then it's always very long. So, uh, but uh, maybe it's not very long so far. But uh, let me add the ICC, okay? And that is the uh, what you have uh, uh, coming out of the, these uh, tribunals. First of all, what's very interesting is they haven't ended. Everyone thought this would be a shorter uh, deal, uh, but uh, and, you know they always give them an additional budget. You know, people say it's kind of uh, you know they they can't thrive, but they survive, right? And um, and uh, so the ad hoc uh, tribunals continue. Uh, there's a, a very interesting scholarship about the re relationship of uh, these judgments to local justice, and that's you know goes back to you know uh, my work on transitional justice. I'm happy to get into that in questions if anybody is, is interested. But part of what um, part of what we see is that. Uh, they go on to play different roles, and, uh, and again, uh, often this, uh, the view that, uh, the, that the courts and this body of ju that is, exists in order to apply judgment uh, and, to, and to condemn these, the, this treatment of peoples, ethnic peoples, this continues to play a very active role, for example, in, in Europe. The EU uh, has indicated, that, you know, and, and very recently, that uh, Serbia, Serbia's membership in, in the EU and also in, its, in the accession process for Turkey, that they have to make uh, clear uh, steps to show that they uh, will uh, respect these norms and will, in, you know, uh, actually bring, you know, many, in, in, with respect to Serbia, bring the 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 last big uh, fugitive um, to the tribunal, and that was done uh, very recently. The um, uh, General Mladic, who was the military general who was responsible uh, militarily for the genocide at Srebrenica, of course that has to be found by a court of law, so you can't just quote me on that, but you know, so that's the allegation. Uh, he was turned over to uh, Europe, and what's very to the, to the um, ICTY, 
uh, and, and there were uh, statements by the EU at the time that this is very important, that showing uh, this uh, uh, compliance that for states, when states show compliance to these norms, uh, they are then going to be taken seriously uh, in other other uh, bodies and other uh, other uh, um, political uh, political unions. So that uh, has been an interesting uh, development. Now, just lastly, the ICC, and certainly we can talk more about this in, in question time. Um, what part of what's interesting is that you have this new uh, body, not so new, a decade. The, the chief prosecutor will step down uh, at the end of this year. Uh, he is a compatriot from my home country, Argentina. I know him way back. Uh, I know him from before he became a chief. He was the deputy prosecutor in the trial of the generals in uh, the junta in Argentina. And what he said when he first took office is, this is a, uh, these are the first steps of a court of last resort. And that uh, underscores for us uh, that the way uh, state sovereignty was going to be reconciled with this, you know, these changing norms and enforcement machines was to say that, uh, that yes, the normativity exists and there is going to be a court, but the jurisdiction of the court is quote unquote complementary, okay? Not like complementary, like you look so good, but with an E, and it basically is filling the gaps, okay? Filling the gaps of where states are un either unwilling or unable uh, to do this themselves. And so the court has become a very uh, active body uh, because uh, much of its action is behind the scenes. There hasn't been a conviction yet, okay? And part of, you know, now, you know, he, uh, uh, Luis Moreno is, you know, if he's concerned about his legacy, one of the questions, you know, and I go back to that early statement, he said the proof of the success of this court will be if there are no convictions, there are no trials. Um, and, and the reason would be that here you have a group of state signatories and that this is a commitment by states um, not to uh, uh, think of state security in terms of their state interests, but rather to uh, adhere to these uh, humanitarian uh, norms and the norms that I described as involving humanity law. And, um, and so this is part of what uh, the court is up to. Um, I'm happy to talk about a variety of these uh, issues. Clearly, there, uh, there are political um, uh, uh, dimensions uh, to uh, situations that have gotten to the, to the court. Um, that's very interesting, is that what we're seeing, and you know, this is part of the framework that I've been describing, is that there's a, there is a clear usefulness for political actors of the, these legal norms and, uh, uh, and uh, institutions. And you can see the Security Council in a number of instances uh, turning to the court. It wasn't the way I think people thought the court would work in the beginning. I think they thought that, that uh, it would be really, you know, a concern about a wild prosecutor, a prosecutor that was uh, independent of the Security Council in the UN. And in fact, many, uh, much, many of this, uh, the um, major military powers are not members of the ICC for exactly that reason. Russia, China, and the US are not members of the, of, not the Security Council, not members of the, uh, of the ICC because of their concern that it would be their soldiers, and at least that's how it was expressed, not their state political leaders, but they said it was the concern that it would be their soldiers that would be hauled before the court. What's very interesting is that we're seeing um, even the US that isn't a signatory, and as I mentioned, many of the countries of the Security Council are not members of this institution, and yet turning to the institution in order to do what? And that's really the question. Really, the, uh, the court uh, is being brought in and meshed in what you could argue is the regulation of conflict. Um, and there are many instances where the court is investigating uh, claims. Um, uh, some of these are, are, um, are not uh, seen uh, in, in the papers. Um, there have been in instances uh, in Latin America, uh, the Middle East has been referred to, uh, to the court, um, and most recently the Mexican drug war. Okay? So what we see is uh, a recognition uh, by a variety of political actors that uh, this is, these norms uh, don't just apply uh, to states, but rather, uh, that, but they don't also just apply to non-state actors, that states have duties uh, uh, to protect uh, human security, but also non-state actors, and that where uh, states are, are unwilling or unable in some way shielding uh, private actors, there is this increasing acceptance, and I think, you know, it, it certainly, 
If you, if you bring this together with the um, with the Occupy movement, with the uh, the claims for accountability in the economic area, and, and which also relates to human security, you know, the, the aims for a minimum, some kind of minimal threshold of human security, uh, also uh, involves uh, economic. Uh, um, and, the, the area of economic justice is often used, often referred to in, in scholarly literature by the same name, global justice. Okay, it's very interesting. Scholars are divided the way they use that term. Uh, Human Rights Watch uses global justice to refer to criminal uh, prosecute punishment, and then uh, a large body of human rights scholars uh, in other areas use it to refer to, to economic um, uh, well-being. And, uh, and minimum guarantees of medicine and other other uh, other uh, uh, other uh, protection. So you have this uh, uh, movement way beyond. You know, as I said, the, the, the application has gone beyond what people thought. Um, and the most recent one is the R2P, the responsibility to protect uh, that I mentioned. And let me just say, you know, uh, end by talking just a, a couple of minutes about this. Um, the the uh, development at the UN, as I mentioned, you know, there's still the existing post World War II security framework, right? The UN Charter, the same countries that were the victors at the end of the war, um, uh, are uh, are in the Security Council plus Germany. Uh, but you also uh, have uh, um, this added uh, um, tinkering, let's say, at the margins. That is, you know, sort of moving in. I would say from the periphery more and more to the center. It, and and uh, responsibility to protect, which started out uh, um, really being discussed by NGOs and by uh, Kofi Annan uh, at the end of the uh, uh, terrible genocidal wars of the 1990s. Um, you know, his concern was that this happened on his watch. And, um, and he said, you know, if there's one thing that the UN has to do is, is figure this out and really uh, uh, come up with a, a duty uh, to protect and how, you know, what form should it take. So it started really with study groups and then by 2005 and 2006, you start getting uh, a number of resolutions, including at the level of the Security Council, where there is this commitment to protection, responsibility to protect. Now, what's very interesting is, uh, for the moment, um, in the words of Ban Ki-moon, uh, the commitment is narrow but deep. Okay, you know that could be like Brown v. Board. You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you you you, you have some kind of. Um, of, uh, of remedy, but it's, you know, it's going to be deliberate, right? Uh, with all deliberate speed. So narrow but deep. Narrow in the sense that it relates to only the most serious offenses, the ones I've already enumerated, at the, that are criminal offenses at the level of the ICC. And it's very interesting. They chose to limit it to those criminal offenses. Genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. They didn't include environmental degradation, floods, and so on. And so, you know, it's, it, this is a live debate about what the responsibility to protect should be. Uh, but what, the, what they've gone on to say is that there, there are uh, layered duties that relate to this. And to use again this magic word of complementarity. I would say, again, if you were going to reduce everything to one word, it would be complementarity. The world we live in involves layered uh, 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 duties. And, um, and so how do you reconcile sovereignty with these, these normative changes? The first duty is upon the states. And, and it's states that have to honor the responsibility to protect, including of, of, of peoples that uh, may not be the majority uh, ethnically uh, in, in those countries. And then, um, and then if those states are uh, unable or unwilling, the exact same language that appears in the ICC, if they're unable or unwilling, then other duties kick in, including in the region and, um, and um, multilater multilaterally, uh, potentially. And that's what we saw with respect to, to Libya. And it was a very strange thing because my book was going to press and then all of a sudden I said, whoa, you know, I, I, additions had to be made and it's the first time really that you have that claim and we saw uh, of in quite, you know, okay, it wasn't days, it wasn't weeks, but, uh, uh, but uh, there was uh, an end to uh, uh, at least one kind of violence, whether there's others that is more, you know, whether there's other violence in the region that is more politically uh, motivated and that has to do with other kinds of, of, of uh, ways of thinking about the relationship of peoples, uh, will, only time will tell. Let me leave time uh, for uh, questions and uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. So uh, I think Roger will leave it at uh,
So, um, Mr. Nectel will take questions in about half an hour. So, uh, Alan? Yeah, um, two, if I'm entitled. Uh, one is general and one is specific. General. You look familiar, so, uh, last name? Alan Sussman. Yeah, I, thought, I think we, I, I know who um, 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 I think normativity. Okay. Uh, um, I'm wondering uh, if, if there are uh, two normativities, or, or perhaps a normativity of an exclusive sort, and, the, and, and then all the rest. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with all that you said about everything, but, but that... Stop right now. Thanks. But that the... Um, the normativity of the legal world is one thing, and the normativity of the political world seems to be quite another. So that we have, uh, judicially speaking, in America, let's say the Second Circuit or the Ninth Circuit, being very willing to take on the universal nature of, of claiming and honor international treaties and so on, might have been domestically, but we have people running for president who are climbing over themselves to run in the opposite direction. Uh, and even Obama doesn't get very good marks on, on being uh, in the same normative universe that you or I might be in. So I'm wondering if the word normativity might be uh, more of a, a bit of an aspiration rather than a reality, or if there are different spheres of normativity. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, well, I'm sure there are different spheres, uh, but my argument is that, uh, in fact, uh, for a variety of reasons, and we could think about what those reasons might be, this is a moment where the legal uh, vocabulary of accountability um, is on the rise. And if you uh, look at, um, if you, you know, and again, this is not the kind of, of, um, of research I do. I did a little bit of, you know, sort of number crunching of certain you know, words that political actors use, and certainly Obama, and if you think about his Cairo speech or his Nobel Prize, um, he, he articulated this very clearly. He said uh, that, um, that there are uh, certain uh, evils that uh, will need to, where you'll need to use force. He talked about it in both uh, legal terms and with respect to the use of force. So it's part of, it's those two bits of it. You know, when you talk about spheres, you know, uh, this is not um, sort of just theory and law in the books or law in the courtroom. It's, it's the way law is used and legal understandings of, of uh, accountability and protection of humans, uh, the way this is used to justify political action. So that's what interests me. Now you could say, well, so, you know, uh, why is it case by case, or why, you know, there's, the skepticism could be, you know, targeted to particular. You could say, why is it the U.S. Uh, um, less um, uh, law abiding or or tends to use arguments of exceptions? So that would be a different kind of skepticism. But my uh, my uh, strong sense is that this is a very appealing uh, uh, language, uh, and part of it is. It's universalizable. It's not always universal, but it's universalizable in a way that uh, certain religious discourses and others that are more controversial and up for grabs right now uh, wouldn't be. So that's you know that that's my view. Now, when you talk about the Second Circuit and and Ninth Circuit, certainly you know the the purview of courts. Obviously, this is you know what courts do apply law. But how do those cases get to the, to the courts? Uh, you know, multinationals uh, using uh, the law, uh, a, you know, variety of NGOs, um, you know, there are a number of instances where you can see that uh, that the turn to courts is not just being, you know, yes, that you, there are lawyers involved, but it isn't just the universe of lawyers, it's really political and economic actors that are turning to courts for uh, conflict resolution. So, anyway, uh, obviously there are uh, a number of different uh, uh, dimensions to your argument. The one I do agree with is that there is still, of course, a gap between the full protection, you know, having a world that is completely shaped by human security. I can't say that that is, you know, the world we live in. On the other hand, uh, when you see that more and more uh, justifications that are based on defensive states and state interests and state borders uh, don't, you know, are not recognized and are seen as almost impermissible, um, that is a very interesting set of developments to my mind. And that, you know, points suggests that we're, in, you know, even wars like Iraq and Afghanistan, as contested as they were, had human security arguments 
in addition to the state interest argument. So, um, the, you know, the argument in Afghanistan, I mean, people did talk about the human rights of women there, right? They talked, and in, in, in the case of Iraq, okay, you can, you can you, laugh, but, you know, I am concerned about women in, in Libya if one of the first laws that's passed after we clear the airspace is, you know, how many wives a, a man can have. I mean, there's going to be contestation, uh, and gender is going to be one of those playing fields. And it'll be interesting to see what role, you know, certain UN resolutions will play in that, because that will be a way to go to, you know, something that is more universalizable than than uh, than uh, other discourses. And to, to give you an example, Kitty McKinnon, you know, Catherine McKinnon, a well-known feminist, has moved away from human rights law to this framework, to the law of war. And really, her view is that, you know, that's a place where the offenses are clear, where they're recognized, where, you know, rape and so on is being enforced by a tribunal without uh, the, the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, waffling and undermining, and that also uh, gender plays a different role in combat than it does in, in ordinary times. So it's a very interesting question, you know, where people turn to the law of war for greater protection than, than you can find in many countries of, of the world. So, yeah. Alan, do you have another question? Oh, I'll yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question as to whether or not this could be like an overly Western idea of justice. Um, uh, because it's supposed to be for human security, uh, like the greater human good. And, and I'm one, a few things uh, sort of sparked that. Uh, one, you said it was, I guess, sort of put together by the victors of the war in Germany, who are a big proponent the of the Nuremberg place. example. Oh, yeah, obviously, so there are other, yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, the others, you know, yeah. the ICC was General Assembly, and, and mostly small states were behind that. And just, and nobody thought it would work. Okay. And you, the, the, <laughs> the American delegate almost went home before the end of it. I mean, that is, the, you know, an interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and then the other thing I, I was wondering, one is, is the huge focus on, on um, legal action mm -hmm. uh, to deal with these human rights problems. The other thing is, is the focus on uh, anti-terrorism, or you mentioned a little bit of anti-drug law, or anti-drug action, which seem to be big, uh, like, Western ideas of justice. And terrorism? Anti-terrorism? Counter-terrorism, counter yeah. Um, and what, did, did you want to finish the thought? The thought um, <laughs> no, well, I, just if, if that seems, if, if first of all, that if I'm correct in that thinking, and also if that is problematic mm -hmm. um, by not including the entire human in, or like, in, like all humans in it. Right. No, so uh, of course I, I would be concerned if I thought of it as, as only Western, and uh, in fact, the, the, there's a blurb in the back of the book by uh, Bob Cohen to uh, raise the issue of, of China. And where, what role, what would China have to say about you know humanity law framework? Which is a, it would be a, it's an interesting question. Um, part of what I would say is that uh, uh, many of the illustrations and cases that I look at um, uh, don't just relate <coughs> to industrialized states in in, in, in the West. Um, and you know where does Latin America fit in your in your map, right? Um, yeah. I mean, okay, it's not Asia, but you know, it's not the U.S. either, and it's not Europe. Uh, there, you know, one of the places where the courts have been uh, most active has been the Inter-American Court, and in, in, uh, in, in really uh, providing remedies and thinking about uh, about the protection of you know those who are survivors have disappeared and so on, and you know, and terrorism plays a role there too. I mean, one of the leading cases that has gone to the Inter-American Court involved. Um, terror and counter-terror from the Fujimori period. And, you know, in Latin America, ter terrorism was a, b a big term way before uh, the U.S. Uh, discovered it in the 1990s. And many of us who wrote about transitional justice, you know, that that was, you know, every people who were labeled enemies of the state, many of them were labeled terrorists, right? And, and, and so on. So, um, um, I, I would say that, uh, that, uh, that uh, he, this, re, these references to the importance of having some form of accountability appear on all sides of, of this um, uh, the divide that you're talking about. And in fact, one of the most central cases uh, that that raises issues that terrorism raises, and I'm not you know this is without even buying into that term, but the whole question you know of intimidation by non-state actors is at this point being addressed specifically by, uh, by courts in claims that are brought uh, by private actors. Um, it's in instances where states often can't, you know, are not able to uh, deal with the issue or choose not to, and, uh, and the courts have, uh, have um, addressed it. Now, 
Uh, I do think it's interesting, it's something to ponder, of uh, the U.S. Uh, re response to 9-11 and so on, and that whole ongoing, right, <coughs> people refer to Obama and the shortcomings, apparent shortcomings of the current administration policy. I think it's very interesting that a lot of the debates, and that's what I'm looking at, is how do the debates end up on, in, the legal, in the legal realm? So, you know, it's not whether we're for or against, but it's, that's an interesting uh, development. And so, you know, we spent the first a couple of years under the Bush period, you know, what is this? Is it a, what kind of war is this? You know, they call it a global war, and they call it a global war on purpose, right? Because it shapes what kind of, you know, norms, uh, uh, it, you know, calling it a war would mean, you know, uh, thinking about this in terms of the law of war. Of course, then they say that almost all of the law of war doesn't apply, right? So, you know, you can have this infinite regress about the law. But then the other point that and, uh, the Obama administration hasn't, um, really stepped away from this either, is what do we call those people, right? And so, you know, the, the whole debate, instead of, you know, really talking about the politics and the fact that we had actually supported bin Laden in the war on communism, and my students, I, I, I was teaching at the time, my students, you know, wondered, where did this come from? You know, it came from the sky, right? Like, literally, from the sky. No. Uh, and, um, and instead of getting into those questions, it was really, what do we call them, legally? And, uh, and, and so now it's not enemy combatants, it's alien enemy belligerents, uh, AEVs, okay, which is like worse, all right, I think, you know, I mean, uh, apparently the treatment is better in the sense that there won't be torture, so that's an explicit, that's an area of progress, but again, the debates were legal, right, it was, is torture legal? Is torture, you know, is what they're doing legal? Is waterboarding legal? I mean, all, if you think about the three, four central debates that dominated the media, and then, you know, even before that, going into the Iraq war, it wasn't about the politics. Is, is there evidence, right? Where, you know, everything, you know, the UN became a court of law, right? Where where you have Colin Powell showing the evidence, right? The, the, the non-evidence, right? So, so that's very interesting to me, you know, is, is this quest for some kind of arbiter uh, and uh, the language of constraint um, now, not all of which needs to be, should be accepted, but I think that if once we see it, then we're in a better position really to, you know, to uh, uh, make uh, the, the right arguments and, and to understand. So, I don't know. Uh, I'm interested in what you're saying about the observation of responsibility for task, because it seems to me that um, while we may be using that term, what is seen as warranting um, intervention is still fairly arbitrary in terms of human rights. Like, you know, we, we intervened in Libya for human rights violations, but we didn't intervene in Darfur, and there's not really a place to intervene in Syria. So I wonder if um, it's not possible that states are still acting according to interest, but then we throw on these terms of responsi responsibility to protect or human rights violations in order to make interest-driven um, intervention more legitimate. Well. If that's what's going on, it would be bad. It would be wrong, right? But I think the more people understand about, you know, this framework and the appeals politically, I think once you start talking about other institutions and other actors using this, not not just state actors, right? Where there are claims being made and uh, demands being made by, you know, in Libya, demands being made by uh, people in Libya, and it was the existing, you know, uh, uh, council. That you know that said, don't stop. You know, come, you know, to, to, to intervene in the Arab League. I mean, that was an instance where there was, you know, I, I think the consensus surprised everyone, and then the actions were taken. You know, decision was taken very quickly, and that's part of what people want worry about. That you know, there are other instances where there has been inaction and, and slow the over deliberation, and you know, maybe the you know, but. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm, and maybe this is the optimism, um, I don't think, to my mind, the fact that, that decisions are made case by case within a principled framework doesn't mean that that is uh, arbitrary and, uh, and, and pretextual. Um, decisions uh, about entering militarily on humanitarian grounds are always going to involve two sides of the